So the title of today's message is the book of Daniel, the Stone Kingdom. And a few weeks ago, I started a series on Daniel, and I'm glad to be back so that we can continue. In part one, we looked at this question asked in Revelation 6, verse 17. For, great, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? That's a good question, isn't it? Who will be able to stand? And we saw that that meaning for stand in the Bible doesn't just mean that you happen to be standing in whatever place. It means to cause or make to stand, to make firm, to stand immovable, to be of a steadfast mind. It designates one who does not hesitate or does not waver. You want that kind of experience, Christian experience? We need that, don't we? Now, we also saw last time that the book of Daniel, in its four lines of prophecy, summarizes and contains the sealing message. And so in Daniel chapter 2, the basic message here is that God will set up his kingdom. That's the stone kingdom. We're going to focus more on that today. In Daniel chapter 7, even though the same basic history is repeated, there's some different symbols that are used, but there's a new element added in Daniel chapter 7, and that is a judgment that takes place just before the second coming. In Daniel chapter 8, there's another new element added to the same basic sequence of prophecy, and that is that there is a cleansing of the sanctuary that takes place. And so we saw as we lined up uh, the unique message in each of these lines of prophecy that a very clear message is presented in Daniel chapter 2, God will set up his kingdom. Daniel chapter 7 adds that he will set up his kingdom through a process of judgment. And then Daniel chapter 8 adds to that, that this process of judgment will purify God's people from sin. And then the last line of prophecy in Daniel, chapters 10 through 12, explain a little bit more clearly that God will do all of this so that his people can stand in Christ's presence when Michael or Jesus Christ stands up and probation closes. Now, when Jesus stands up, we're going to see today that this stone kingdom, the kingdom of God, will be made up. Its subjects will be determined at the close of probation when Jesus stands up, sometimes shortly before the second coming. So we want to be part of that kingdom, don't we? And the time to make sure that we are part of the kingdom is right now. Kind of giving you the punchline, like the last paragraph of the book right now. How does that work? We're going to look at that in a little bit more detail. If you look at a dictionary such as lexico.com, it will tell you this. A kingdom is a realm associated with or regarded as being under the control of a particular person or thing. In other words, in the ideal human kingdom, all of the citizens or subjects of that particular kingdom will think the way the king thinks and ideally they will act the way the king acts. That's what most kings have wanted through history is that their subjects will think and act like they do. That seems to be the way of human kingdoms. And it's been that way ever since Satan found himself cast out of heaven and placed down here on earth. Jesus said, shortly before his arrest, this is John 14, 30, he says, the prince of this world cometh. And he's speaking about Satan there. Jesus was acknowledging that for the time being, at least temporarily, there is a ruler of this world, and that ruler is Satan himself. Turn with me. You are going to need your Bible today. Turn to Genesis chapter 3, and we can see what the goal of the devil has been since day number one that he began his work on humanity. Genesis chapter 3, here the serpent is speaking with Eve. Of course, the serpent is possessed by the devil, so this is Satan himself speaking to Eve. And in Genesis 3 verse 4, we read this, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Now, who had just told her that you will surely die if you eat from the forbidden tree? God had just told her that. And so here is a direct lie from the devil. And the lie is this. God is a liar and his character cannot be trusted. Isn't that what the devil was saying? 
Didn't use those words, but that was the message. Can you trust God? Because I'm going to tell you something completely opposite. Maybe you can't trust God. Maybe his character is not trustworthy. Now, Satan goes on in the next verse. This is verse number five. Now he tells Eve, For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Here's the second part of the lie, and it's connected. The second part of the lie is this, that following God's law prevents true happiness and fulfillment in life. You ever heard people express that statement? Well, if I follow God, if I give my life to Him, if I do what the Bible says, I won't have any more fun. Right? That idea is out there, and it's been out there for a very long time. So two lies. Number one, God is a liar. His character cannot be trusted. Number two, that following God's law, obeying Him out of love, will somehow be a detriment to your life. You won't be as fulfilled. You won't be as happy. And this is the kingdom that the devil's been trying to set up here on earth ever since the Garden of Eden. And he wants to get every person on this earth to think the same way he thinks and ultimately to act the same way he acted. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. The devil's been very effective, hasn't he? In his lies, in his propaganda through history. Interesting statement here. Cast out of heaven, Satan set up his kingdom in this world, and ever since he has been untiringly striving to seduce human beings from their allegiance to God. He uses the same power that he used in heaven, the influence of mind upon mind. Never underestimate the influence that you have on other people or that other people have on you. This was the warfare, primarily, the warfare that Satan engaged in in heaven. It was a mind game, mind wars. How do you think, and therefore, how do you act? And he carried out, continued that warfare here on earth. Going on in this statement, men become tempters of their fellow men. The strong, corrupting sentiments of Satan are cherished, and they exert a masterly, compelling power. Under the influence of these sentiments, men bind up with one another in confederacies. This is how the kingdoms of this earth have progressed through time. Now, Jesus, in his statement, he said something amazing. He said, the prince of this world cometh. Jesus knew that Satan was coming for him. But then he said what? He hath how much? Nothing in me. And this infuriated the devil, didn't it? That there could actually be a human being whose name was Jesus Christ that would be completely impervious to the devil's temptations, to his mind games. And Jesus said, he has nothing in me. We're going to see before we're finished today that this stone kingdom that Daniel chapter 2 talks about, God wants all of you to be part of that kingdom. And he has promised that when you become part of his kingdom, you can have the mind of Christ and you too can resist the temptations of Satan. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 2. We studied this in our lesson study this morning. We're going to focus in a little bit longer on the dream itself. Daniel chapter 2, I'm going to start reading in verse number 27. Daniel now has had his night of prayer with his friends and he's standing in front of King Nebuchadnezzar. And he says in verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And now Daniel begins to relate to the king what he dreamed that night. Let's jump down to verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. 
This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the entire earth. It's quite a dream. Now, if you had dreamed that dream last night, you would probably wake up wondering, what was that about? Just like Nebuchadnezzar had. And as Nebuchadnezzar listens to this Hebrew captive, he realizes that the God of heaven is speaking directly to his heart. And he recognizes that this is what he dreamed. And now he wants to know, what does it mean? Well, here we have, I like charts. They help me understand. So here we have a chart, the basic elements of the dream. There's a head of gold, isn't there? And then there's a chest and arms of silver. There's a belly and thighs of brass. And then there's some legs made of iron. And after this, at the bottom of the image, the iron becomes mixed with clay and the feet. And then at the very end of the feet, there's 10 toes. And then finally, this stone kingdom, which comes in from outer space and smashes this entire image. Now Daniel's going to explain to the king what these symbols represent. So let's just keep reading Daniel chapter 2, verse 36. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Apparently, Daniel was there with his three friends as well. They had all prayed together, and I believe Daniel brought them with him as he stood before the king. Verse 37, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. So we see that the head of gold represents a Babylon. And it becomes clear as the explanation continues that it's not just Nebuchadnezzar, it's not just him as a king, it's actually his entire kingdom, this kingdom of Babylon. Now, this was what historians call the Neo-Babylonian Empire. It had been built by Nebuchadnezzar's uh, father, Nabopolassar, and they had built, rebuilt Babylon on the site of ancient Babel. So the Tower of Babel recorded in Genesis is the precursor to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. So if we want to understand the mindset of Babylon and therefore the mindset of the entire image, we need to go all the way back to Babel. So take your Bible. We'll come back to Daniel 2, but let's jump to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. We're looking now at the mindset of the Tower of Babel builders, and that's going to help us understand the rest of Daniel chapter 2. Now in Genesis chapter 10, we have a, uh, a list of Noah's descendants. And verse 6 of Genesis 10 says that the sons of Ham were Cush and Mizram and Put and Canaan. And then if you jump down to verse 8, it says that Cush began Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. <clears throat> now you, you read the history and you look at the legends about Nimrod. This doesn't mean that he was a a hunter doing the Lord's work. He was um, a great rebel against God. And we see that in verse 10. The beginning of his kingdom was what? Babel. And this is actually the first verse in the Bible where we find the word kingdom. And it's in reference to Babel and the Tower of Babel. Now we'll look in a minute at the very last verse time that we find the word kingdom in the Bible. It's in Revelation chapter 17. But here is the first time that we find the word kingdom in the Bible. So what was going on with Babel? If you look at the next chapter, Genesis chapter 11, not only were they building a great tower, but there was a mindset, a worldview, a way of thinking and acting that was binding all of these people together. 
So Genesis 11 verse 1 begins, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And the implication here is that they are also thinking the same way. They have the same mindset. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. What did these Babel builders fear more than anything else? They feared being scattered. They wanted that unity, that cohesion, through which they could build a worldwide empire. We read this in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 123. The men of Babel had determined to establish a government that should be independent of God. Their confederacy was founded in rebellion, a kingdom established for self-exaltation, but in which God was to have no rule or honor. Had this confederacy been permitted, a mighty power would have borne sway to banish righteousness and with it peace, happiness, and security from the earth. For the divine statutes, which are holy and just and good, men were endeavoring to substitute laws to suit the purpose of their own selfish and cruel hearts. This was the mindset of the Babel builders, and it becomes the mindset of Babylon centuries later. And at the very end of time, it becomes the mindset of spiritual Babylon, which describes a worldwide unification of humanity against God. But if we want to understand what is happening, we have to go all the way back to the beginning right here. Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What happens up here in the head, in the mind, determines how we live our life and determines who we become. It shapes our character, doesn't it? It shapes the choices we make, the decisions we make, and ultimately whom we serve and whom we worship. Now it's interesting, in Daniel chapter 2, as Daniel begins explaining to Nebuchadnezzar, he says, you are the head of gold. In other words, the way you think as the king of Babylon will in some way determine how the rest of the kingdoms think all the way through to the end of time. As a man thinketh, so is he. So how did Babylon think? Well, ultimately, praise God, Nebuchadnezzar, it's a miracle. He becomes a servant of God. But not before he tries to kill the servants of God, right? We're going to study Daniel chapter 3 shortly. We know the story, the fiery furnace. And we see here that in Babylon, this is the Babylonian mindset, Church and state are united to enforce false worship. This is what happens in the kingdom of Babylon. It actually is what was happening at the Tower of Babel. Politics and religion uniting together to try to force people to think and act in a certain way. The same way that the kingly powers say you should think and act. So this is the head of gold. This is how Babylon thinks. Now let's go on to uh, Daniel 2, verse 38. Daniel says, Wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. See, even here Daniel is suggesting that the rest of humanity will eventually absorb this mindset in some degree or another. You will rule over them all, this, this mindset of church and state united to enforce worship. And then he says, you are this head of gold. Verse 39, Daniel goes on, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and then another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all of the earth. Okay, so we have the progression of empires. We know that uh, Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians. That's recorded in Daniel chapter 5. Now, the Medes and the Persians took their laws very seriously, didn't they? Remember the story of um, Daniel in the lion's den. 
Daniel chapter 6. The king, who is now the king of Persia, he's of the Medes and Persians, he's tricked into signing a law, isn't he? And that law said that nobody should worship any god except the king for just 30 days. And when the king finds out that he's been duped by Daniel's enemies, he tries to find a way to change the law, doesn't he? And it doesn't work. He can't do it. Because the Medes and the Persians lifted up their laws and they said they're infallible. They cannot be changed. The same thing happens years later in the story of Esther when Haman, again, kind of tricks the king into signing a law to destroy all of the Jews, all of God's people. And when it becomes known through Esther's bravery, she reveals Haman and his wickedness and the plot, but the law cannot be changed. The king has to write a new law stating that on the day that the Jews are to be exterminated, they can defend themselves. That's the best he can do. He can't just cancel the law. He can't just scrub the law out because in the Medes and Persians' mindset, human laws are infallible. So we can add that to this uh, mindset of the image in Daniel chapter 2. From the Babylonians, we get that church and state unite to enforce false worship. From the Medes and the Persians, we add to that this concept of infallibility. Human laws cannot be changed. They're that important. And then came the belly and thighs of brass, and we know that Greece follows next. Now, Greece was an interesting empire, fascinating one. We look at our culture today and the different aspects of society and culture, and almost all of them in some form or another hearken back to ancient Greece. So from the Greeks, we get philosophy. We get the practice of medicine. We get education. We get art and architecture, and the list could go on and on. All of these things that make culture at least Western culture, they go back to Greece. And what we see here in Daniel chapter 2 is that all of these things, although there may be some good aspects to all of these things like education and philosophy and so forth, ultimately, in this world, they will end up being absorbed by the mindset of the king of this world and they will be used for his purposes. So education will become a system that for a Christian is not safe to trust. Medicine might become a system that for a Christian becomes unsafe to trust. Philosophy will become a practice that for the Christian might become dangerous and we could go down the list. Part of the mindset of the image of Daniel chapter 2. And then Daniel goes on. This is now verse number 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as what? Iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And so we know that Rome comes next. Now what did we inherit as uh, a culture, as Western society? What do we inherit from Rome? Well, Rome was big on its laws too. Strong government, strong laws, and especially in regards to Christians, persecution for those refusing to go along with what you're told to do. And so now we can add this as well to this empire of earth, this kingdom that Satan is trying to build on earth. Now let's just go down this list. From Babylon, we get the church and state unite to enforce false worship. The devil wants every person living on earth to look at that idea and say, yeah, that's a good idea. I think that church and state should be united together and we should all be told how to worship. That's what the devil wants. The devil wants people to look at the idea of human law and say, they can't be changed. They should be infallible. Our laws are that important. That's a good idea. Let's do that. Let's make that part of our society. The devil would love to take philosophy and medicine and education and art and everything else that could be blessings and to twist them and turn them 
and make them into curses instead. And to have people believe that it's a good thing as that process happens. And then finally, the devil would love to have the subjects of his kingdom say, yes, it's a good idea to persecute those who don't think like we do, who choose to maybe, say, follow the Bible and what God says rather than what the human systems are telling them to do. That's a good idea. Let's do that. Let's go persecute some people. How does this happen? It's part of the mind war, the mind games that the devil has been engaged in for so many years. Now the prophecy continues. Let's read verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, forasmuch as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Now at this point, point, we need to proceed carefully through the symbolism of the image. We have had so far four empires that have followed each other very clearly in world history. I mean, you can look at the history books and, and see this very clearly. Babylon fell to Medo-Persia. That was 538 BC. And it fell through fighting, war, right? Army against army. Whoever was stronger wins. And then Medo-Persia fell to Greece and there were big battles that took place involving, according to some reports, millions of soldiers involved in these battles. When these kings went to war, they were serious about what they were doing. But, right, it's the strength of arms bringing the next kingdom into place. And then Greece eventually falls to Rome. But Rome never falls to a single enemy, does it? When we look at what happened to the pagan Roman Empire, it just kind of disintegrated over time. It got weakened from the inside. A lot of historians have said it was moral decay that brought about the fall of the Roman Empire. So there is no single battle. There is no next empire like the Incas did not conquer Rome, right? Or the Chinese did not conquer Rome. It just kind of disintegrates. And that's what we see described here in the vision. The legs of iron, which represented that pagan Roman Empire, they just kind of disintegrate in the feet into iron and clay mixed together. Now look closely at verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. At the beginning of the verse, the clay is described as potter's clay. At the end of the verse, it's called miry clay. The last two words that you have there in verse 41. There is a shift in the clay from potter's clay to miry clay. And we're going to see that that is a prediction of what will happen to Christianity as it interacts with the kingdoms of this world. So we're going to see the feet of iron and clay represents papal Rome. Remember, Rome continues through the end of time in some form or another. So papal Rome, we're here at the feet. We're going to see that it's Christianity conformed to the mindset of this world. Now, what is potter's clay according to the Bible? In Isaiah 64, verse 8, we read this. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thine hand. So according to Isaiah 64, verse 8, potter's clay represents God's people. God is the potter. His people are the clay, and he is shaping them to be who he wants them to be. Jeremiah 18, verse 6 is similar. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in mine hand, O house of Israel. God wants to shape his people. He always has. It's always been his purpose. You look at the promise he gave to Israel right after he brought them out of um, ex, uh, Egypt. In Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, he says, I want to make you a holy nation of priests. I want to shape you into this righteous nation. The same promise is given centuries later by Paul, he re, or Peter, he repeats it in reference to the church and the early Christians. And he quotes, very nearly quotes that verse from Exodus 19, verse 6, but he applies it to the church. God wants his people to be a holy nation. That's what he wants for us, isn't it? He wants a holy nation. 
a church full of, of priests who can minister to others, who can share the good news, who can explain the path of salvation. This is what potter's clay is. But then something happens. As this potter's clay interacts with the iron, it changes from something God wants it to be to something very different, miry clay. In Psalm 69, verses 1 and 2, David writes, Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. He's talking about this mire where his feet are stuck. Remember, Jesus talked about building on sand, didn't he? Or quicksand or mire. Not a good idea. You can't stand firm. In Psalm 40, verse 2, we read this. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings. When we look at what happened to established Christianity, or I can say maybe politicized Christianity in the Middle Ages, it took on the form of Romanism, didn't it? It began to reflect the shape, not of the potter, but of the iron that was surrounding it. And as it did that, it transformed from potter's clay to miry clay, a very dangerous place to be. Now what a promise here in Psalm 40, verse 2, that God will take his people out of this horrible pit of miry clay and set their feet upon a what? Upon a rock. We're talking about the stone kingdom today. I praise God that he can take us out of a miry pit and place us on a rock where we can stand firm. We're going to keep looking at that as we continue. Now, here's a very clear definition of what the iron and the clay represent. Manuscript 63, page 18, or the year 1899. The mingling of churchcraft and statecraft is represented by the iron and the clay. This union is weakening all the power of the churches. What should the power of the church be? Not a trick question. It should be God, right? That power is Jesus Christ. That power is faith in Christ. But the mingling of churchcraft and statecraft, when we have iron and clay mixed together, it sucks that power of God out of the church. This investing the church with the power of the state will bring evil results. So we take away God's power and we replace it with political power, the power of the state. Men have almost passed the point of God's forbearance. They have invested their strength in politics and have united with the papacy, the same mindset that defined the papacy through the Dark Ages. By the time, but the time will come when God will punish those who have made void his law and their evil work will recoil upon themselves. We don't want to be part of a system like that, do we? We want to stand on a rock that is firm. And God says, I'll show you how you can. And then we have the ten toes. Let's keep going. Daniel chapter 2, verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And I'll read verse 43 as well. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now remember, this image, according to Daniel's explanation, the entire dream, the entire explanation of Daniel chapter 2 is primarily for us today. It's for the latter days. So we're coming now to the part of the vision that we really need to understand. These toes. And then what happens to them. The feet of iron and clay, we already said, represents papal Rome. The ten toes we see reflected in ten horns in Revelation. So keep your finger in Daniel. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. Now, Revelation 17, if we were looking at the beginning part of the chapter, is focused on mystery Babylon or spiritual Babylon at the end of time. This is a worldwide uh, culmination of the Tower of Babel and ancient Babylon's mindset. 
but now it is worldwide, it is spiritual in scope, and it is a unified humanity fighting against God. Let's look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Now this passage that we just read, verse 12, and then again in verse 17, these are the last verses in the Bible where the word kingdom appears. I think it's significant that the very first time the word kingdom appears in the Bible, it's in reference to the Tower of Babel. The very last time that we see the word kingdom appear is in reference to spiritual Babylon at the end of time. Again, Satan's goal as the prince of this world is to get everybody living in his kingdom to think and to act like him. And we see it happening here in prophecy. Look at verse 13. These ten horns, they have how many minds? Ten minds? One mind. Whose mind would it be? King number five? King number six? No. It's going to be the mindset of the prince of this world. So they have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now, if we look again at our chart here uh, and what each kingdom has contributed, we see that at the end of time, the entire world, described as spiritual Babylon, is going to say, yeah, church and state should unite to enforce worship. That's a good idea. Let's do that. We have one mind. We're going to make it happen. Humanity is going to say, yeah, human laws cannot be changed. This idea of infallibility, that's a good thing. Let's do that. Let's make that part of our system. And let's use philosophy and medicine and education and art and everything else. Let's use all of this to enforce our agenda and to move it forward. And then let's persecute those that don't go along with it. That's a good idea. We have one mind. We're going to make this happen. <clears throat> what happens as a result? <coughs> Look at verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. There's going to be a battle. Revelation calls it the battle of Armageddon. Now, there will probably be some physical fighting involved, but it's primarily a battle for your mind. How do you think? How do you act? Are you a citizen of this world's kingdom, or are you a citizen of Christ's stone kingdom? even if you're still living on this earth. If he hasn't physically rescued you yet, is it possible to live as a citizen of the stone kingdom and to have the mind of Christ? That's the question that we're looking at today. Fascinating statement. For thousands of years, <clears throat> Satan has been experimenting upon the properties of the human mind, and he has learned to know it well, how long have you known your mind? I'm not asking your age, it's okay. You've known it for a few decades. Do you really know yourself? I would say I don't really know myself, right? That's something we keep learning more about. Satan has been studying the human mind for thousands of years, and he has learned to know it well. <clears throat> By his subtle workings in these last days, he is linking the human mind with his own, imbuing it with his thoughts. And he is doing this work in so deceptive a manner that those who accept his guidance know not that they are being led by him at his will. The great deceiver hopes so to confuse the minds of men and women that none but his voice will be heard. That's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? that we become so accustomed to thinking the way that the devil wants us to, that we don't even realize that we are now thinking like the prince of this world and acting like the prince of this world. If you go online, uh, you can search for generations of warfare. And it's kind of interesting. These philosophers of war will talk about 
the, as they see it, the evolving practice of warfare. And they will say, you know, when humans were a little more simple, we would put on bright colored uniforms and we'd stand in a line and we'd charge at each other with sticks, right? That's like first generation warfare. And then we came up with muskets and bayonets and we got a little more effective at destroying each other as we stood in those brightly colored lines. Eventually, we moved to second generation warfare. Now we have rifles and now we can still shoot at each other, but we're further away. And then they go through, through a, a couple of other you know, developments of warfare. They come to fourth generation warfare, which is essentially guerrilla warfare or what we've been dealing with the last couple of de decades as uh, we have urban warfare, things like that. But then they talk about now, and this is pretty recent, fifth generation warfare. And that is the mind game, the information war games, propaganda, uh, instilling fear in people to manipulate populations, to think and to act like you want them to think. And you wonder, well, what does that look like? And I'd say, look at the last 18 months probably get a pretty clear idea of what this kind of warfare is like. This is the kind of warfare that Satan has always engaged in. It took humanity about 6,000 years to get there. But now we're playing along pretty well. And Satan wants none but his voice to be heard. Now comes the good part of the vision, or the dream. Let's go back to Daniel, chapter 18, or chapter 2. And we'll look now at verses 44 and 45. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure." So let's be clear. The stone represents Christ. Throughout the Bible, this symbolism is used. Deuteronomy 32, verse 15, Psalm 95, verse 1, both speak of the rock of our salvation. In Luke chapter 20, verses 17 and 18, Jesus refers to himself as the stone which the builders rejected. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, Paul writes about Israel's wilderness wanderings, and he says, or he talks about that spiritual rock, capital rock, that followed them. And that rock was Christ, according to Paul. So very clearly, ultimately, the stone represents Christ. But in Revelation 17, verse 4, we just read that when the lamb engages in war with those ten kings, he's not alone, is he? His followers are with him, those who are called and faithful and chosen. And so we see in the Bible as well that the church is referred to as rock or smaller rocks. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, verse 5, You also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. God looks at each one of you and he says, I want you to be a living stone placed upon the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. And that stone kingdom represents those that say, yes, I'll answer God's call. I'll be part of his kingdom. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 goes on, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's another way of saying you are those that have been pulled out of miry clay and placed upon the rock. You're part of Christ's kingdom now. You're going to think and act like Christ does. So how is this stone kingdom made? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. 
this stone in Daniel is cut out without hands. And in Hebrew chapter 9, we find something else that is made without hands. Hebrews 9, verse 11 says, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. In other words, the heavenly sanctuary where Christ serves as our high priest, that too, according to the Bible, is made without hands or not made by hands. If we want to understand how Christ is going to make this stone kingdom without hands, then we need to understand what he's doing as our high priest. They explain each other. Now, a few more verses close by in Hebrews chapter 9. Look at a couple verses before. The author of Hebrews, who I believe was Paul, has just described in the first verses of chapter 9 the most holy place and the different parts of the most holy place and what happens there. And then he says this in verse 9. He's talking about this earthly sanctuary. It was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service what? Couldn't make him perfect as pertaining to the conscience. In other words, as amazing as the earthly sanctuary and all of the services were, it couldn't ultimately change the way a person thinks. It couldn't transform them in character. It could lead them to look forward in faith to Christ and what he would do. But those services themselves, there's no uh, saving power in those services. They're just rituals. They can't transform the mind and give us the mind of Christ. Now look at Hebrews 9 verse 14. Speaking now of Christ and his work in the heavenly sanctuary, the Bible tells us how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. See, there's power in the blood of Christ. When we put our faith in a living Savior who is serving as our high priest in heaven, God promises that will transform and change your life. Now you will have my power to think and to act like I want you to, like I've promised you can. And when that transformation occurs, we become part of Christ's stone kingdom. Hebrews 10, verse 16, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Even if there is a human law or mandate that is infallible, that cannot be changed. Those that live in Christ's kingdom will have a higher law that they adhere to. They will have a higher mandate that they obey. And that will be God's law written in their character, in their mind, and in their heart. So here's a conclusion. Christ receives his kingdom fully. When it is full of people, purified in their conscience, they have the mind of Christ. You want to be part of that kingdom? Amen. Now, Jesus said in John 18, verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from here. So the way this warfare is conducted is very different. Christ's kingdom is not going to come by force of arms. It's not going to come by political power. It's not going to become by any of the ways that human kingdoms have come and gone. It's done without hands. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What are those strongholds? It's our imaginations. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Is that actually possible? The Bible says it is. Jesus promises when you are truly living in my stone kingdom, you will be thinking and acting like your king, Jesus Christ. 
and even every thought can be brought into submission to the will of your Savior, Jesus Christ. What a promise. What an incredible promise. Again, Revelation 17, verse 4 says that when these ten horns or the ten toes at the end of time make war with the Lamb, He will overcome them, but not alone. They that are with him are also called and chosen and faithful. How will God, how will the Lamb win this war? He's going to win it with you, with his people in his stone kingdom. Now, do we know that or are we just saying that? Look at the story of Job. You know the story, right? representatives from different worlds come to God one day and Satan shows up as the representative of this earth. Not even representative. He shows up as the prince of this world. And God asks him, where have you been? And he says, I've been walking up and down on the face of the earth. Now, what does that mean? In well, Bible times, even today, right? If you walk a piece of property, what does that imply? You own that piece of property. Right? If you've ever bought land, probably one of the first things you did is walk the border, walk the boundary, find out where my corner posts are. That's what I did when we bought our property. That's what Satan is saying. I have come from the earth. It belongs to me. I've walked all around. And the people that live there, they belong to me. Turn, turn to Job. We need to, we need to understand this. Job chapter 1. <clears throat> If we get the story of Job, we will understand what God is trying to do right now at the very end of time. Job 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and from the earth, and from walking up and down in it. In other words, again, I own the world, and the people that live there think and act the way I do the way I want them to. Now, what happens next? Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Who pointed out Job? God did. And why does he point him out? Because he is about to use Job to refute the devil's lies, to challenge Satan's claim that he rules this world. God goes on, there is no one like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And the devil re retorts, oh, of course, you've blessed him. He's one of the richest men, the wisest men, the most blessed men in the world. Of course he serves you. And as the story progresses, the devil says, if you let me take away everything he possesses, he'll curse you to your face. And God says, go for it. He's all yours. Just don't touch him. You remember the story? Job loses everything, doesn't he? All of his flocks, all of his herds, all of his lands, even his children, they die. And Job remains faithful to God. The devil comes back and says, well, just let me, let me touch Job. Let me afflict him with an illness. Then I'll curse you. And God says, go for it. Just don't kill him. And Job remains faithful. Here's the point. God points out Job in a time of crisis when God's character and his law and his justice is being questioned. And he says, look at Job. He will remain faithful no matter what you do. He serves me in my stone kingdom. God is going to do the same thing at the end of time. As this stone kingdom is set up. And he wants to use you. He wants to use your family. He wants to use this church to refute the devil's claims. Now, we're almost done, but we need to look at one last thing. And that is the timing of the stone kingdom. When is this kingdom set up? Was it set up when Jesus died? Was it set up when he rose from the dead? Will it be set up at the second coming when Jesus comes back? The Bible actually tells us pretty clearly when the stone kingdom is set up, when its subjects are determined. Turn with me to Luke chapter 19. This is important that we understand the timing. You realize that many of the false understandings of truth in regards to the Bible hinge on timing. 
Which day do you worship? Which day does God want you to worship? It's a matter of timing. When you die, do you go straight to heaven or do you wait in the earth? It's a matter of timing, isn't it? When does God set up his kingdom? It's a matter of timing. So Jesus, here, this is shortly before his death, Luke 19, verse 11, he's about to enter Jerusalem. He knows his disciples think that he's about to set up the kingdom of God right then at the triumphal entry. And so he tells them a parable to try to explain the truth. Luke 19, verse 11. As they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And he said, a certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Look at the sequence. Now the noble man is Jesus. He's going to go to a far country. That represents heaven. He's going to receive his kingdom and after he has received his kingdom, then he is going to come back. Look at verse 15. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, that he commanded his servants to be called unto him. And then there's a judgment scene that takes place. Here's the point. Jesus is explaining not only what would happen right then in Jerusalem, this is a prophecy as well. Looking forward to the latter days. And the Bible actually tells us there is a point in time when Jesus goes to receive his kingdom. And it's not at the second coming, it's before the second coming. In Daniel chapter 7, you can turn there if you have your Bible. Daniel chapter 7. The same sequence of empires as Daniel 2 is presented. Now they're animals. So you have Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome. And then verse 9, what happens immediately after that? Daniel 7, verse 9, I beheld till thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. So here's the beginning of the judgment. We call this the antitypical day of atonement. We'll dive into that more in future uh, weeks. This takes place in 1844. We'll look at that time prophecy probably next week. The judgment in heaven begins in 1844. Now it's been going on for quite a while, hasn't it? What else happens during that judgment? Jump down to verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So here Jesus is coming to God the Father, and what happens? Verse 14, there was given him dominion and glory and a what? And a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Here's the point. It's during the judgment before Jesus comes back that he receives his kingdom, that this stone kingdom is determined who will belong to Christ. And then, shortly before Jesus comes back, probation closes. Revelation 22, verse 11. You probably know this verse. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. In other words, a point in time comes after the judgment has been completed, but shortly before the second coming, where people's characters are determined. Their allegiance is set in stone, so to speak. Either they serve the prince of this world or they serve Jesus Christ in his stone kingdom. And look at what Jesus says next, Revelation 22, verse 12. Behold, I come quickly. At that point, when probation closes and decisions are made, now Jesus will come back quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now this is a lengthy statement, but I want you to follow me. Councils on Health, page 44. We are preparing to meet him who, 
escorted by a retinue of holy angels, is to appear in the clouds of heaven to give the faithful and the just the finishing touch of immortality. And you look in 1 Corinthians 15, that finishing touch is the new body we receive at the second coming. When he comes, he is not to cleanse us of our sins, to remove from us the defects in our character, or to cure us of the infirmities of our tempers and our dispositions. If wrought for us at all, this work will all be accomplished before that time. When the Lord comes, those who are holy will be holy still. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, it's okay if I don't overcome this, or I can indulge in this now, Christ will give me victory at the second coming. That's not what the Bible teaches. At the second coming, you receive a new body, an immortal body. That's that finishing touch. But the work of character transformation, Christ says, I will accomplish this before I come back. Let's keep reading. Those who have preserved their bodies and spirits and holiness in sanctification and honor will then receive the finishing touch of immortality. But those who are unjust, unsanctified, and filthy will remain so forever. No work will then be done for them to remove their defects and give them holy characters. The refiner does not then sit to pursue his refining process and remove their sins and their corruption. This is all to be done in these hours of probation. It is now that this work is to be accomplished for us. Now look at this. We are now in God's workshop. Many of us are rough stones from the quarry. And God looks at me and he looks at you. He says, yeah, that stone's a little bit rough. It needs some polishing. But I can take that stone and I can place you into my stone kingdom where you will shine and reflect my character. And I can do that now. You don't have to wait. I can start this work of transformation today. As we lay hold upon the truth of God, its influence affects us. It elevates us and removes from us every imperfection and sin of whatever nature. Thus we are prepared to see the king in his beauty and finally to unite with the pure and heavenly angels in the kingdom of glory. It is here that this work is to be accomplished for us, here that our bodies and spirits are to be fitted for immortality. The stone kingdom is made up of those whom Jesus Christ has redeemed from the power of sin. They think and they act like their king, even in the midst of a world that is in rebellion and darkness and sin. Jesus will use them to refute Satan's charges, vindicate God's character and God's law. In doing this, Christ will destroy the power of Satan's kingdom and he will destroy it without hands by the power of his spirit working in the lives of his people. How many of you want that experience? How many of you feel the need for that experience? God promises that he can work that miracle in you today. And he says, I will carry it on and I will complete it so that you can be ready to stand in my presence when I come. Friends, I believe that stone kingdom is just about to be revealed. I believe we are very close to Christ's second coming. But before we see him come in those clouds of heaven, he must come into our hearts and our minds. And he must work that work inside of us so that we are prepared to stand. And he promises, I will do it. And I will do it in such a way that when the people around you look and see at what I've done in your life, they'll say, I want that experience too. What's happened? Tell me, show me, share it with me. And God says, I will make you a reflector of me to other people. That's the miracle that God wants to do as he polishes all of us. We're all rough stones. But he's promised I can polish every single last one of you, all of us, and place you in my kingdom. 
Praise God that he gives us these promises. Let us seek this every single day. Make it your prayer. Lord, fit me for your kingdom. Polish off those rough edges and accomplish your work in me. He promises that he will do it.